Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for being with us this evening. Boys, it has been a very interesting day. Uh, thank you for joining us. What do you have, Watch? Well, I know you've been on top of things a little more than me. Yeah, today is a very news-heavy day. Uh, you know, we've got like eight to ten different topics that we could talk about in the news. Plus, we have a lot going on with it being uh, Nissan, what is it, Nissan 7-ish um, that we can talk about. We've got a bunch of scripture to go through, a lot of parables that I think are really cool. Um, it's hilarious because a bunch of these parables about the, about taxes land, land on today, which is April 15th, <laughs> tax day. So if you see our title <laughs> about death and taxes and resurrection, it's because uh, yeah. Lazarus was raised on this day roughly 2,000 years ago. Uh, also happens to be tax day and also the parables that te that Jesus was teaching on his way to raise Lazarus. Uh, some of them dealt with tax collectors. So hilarious. Yeah. I should have come up with some good tax jokes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I still, you know. I won't go into a rant on that, but it seems like such a scam. Um, that whole oh, it is. <sighs> I won't. They don't, I won't they don't, get need, the, they don't need the money. I mean, taxes are primarily a uh, an economy control measure in order to take money out of the system to control inflation. That's what it is. It's an inflation control mechanism. Yeah. So um, I I shared a video with a. Uh, a gentleman named Mark Biltz that has been on our show, Watchful sent it to me earlier. I hadn't seen it yet, but he has mentioned uh, almost everything uh, in this video when he was on our show, but uh, I didn't put it together. Uh, I didn't connect the dots. Um, I don't, I'm don't. i not sure if any of us did, but until after it happened. But he uh, essentially called this, um, what's happening with Persia and everything in his book. Mm -hmm. Uh, quite some time yeah. ago. And what's really interesting is that uh, any one of us could have done it if we would have simply just um, read the Bible and applied, you know, the using the, the feast days and God's calendar because that's all he did except he did it really well. And yeah, it, it, it he's coming back on the show tomorrow to talk about it. Um, I really like Mark and, and it's, it's awesome to see different parts of the body of Christ work together to put together the pieces of the puzzle. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a testament of where you should put, where you should spend your attention. You know, if you think of your attention as like a currency that you have to spend, you only have a finite amount of your attention <laughs> yeah. and it's so easy to, to get distracted with other things that seem, you know, like signs and wonders. But the one thing that we know for sure is the sun, moon, and stars are God's clock. Um, and we know the, the, the festivals, the, the feasts and the festivals are his appointed times. So with just those two pieces of information, uh, you, can, you can discern and observe what God is going to do and predict what he is going to do before things happen. Uh, because he's, he's, he's already planned this all out. I mean, these determine when things are going to happen. Uh, it yeah. also tells you what to pray for, where to spend your time in the scripture, you know, things like that. So, you know, spend your spend your attention wisely on things that will definitely yield fruit. You know, just supporting your point here that, you know, all this information was available for all of us to know. So yeah. Mark it, got it, it just from studying the, you know, the the moons and where they are in the in the heavens and uh, the feasts. Yeah. I mean, he he nailed it. I mean, it, it there's. From what I see, and I'm not sure why I didn't put this together, but you know, one one thing I think a lot of us may be guilty of is overcomplicating it. He yeah. simply oh, yeah. he he simply eliminated all the pieces of the puzzle except the the Hebrew calendar, the biblical feast days, and the uh, the heavens. And yeah. when when he broke it down and explained it like that, and but not only explained it like that, went back through history. And explained how every significant war, including the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, and the Vietnam War, all had the exact same signs that followed on the exact same Hebrew days that were in association with these feast days. And I think yeah. the bottom line is, is when you have 
a lunar or solar eclipse that falls on the Hebrew calendar and especially on a feast day, you really need to look into what that really means. Um, as he did, I, it, he did such a good job. I can't re-explain it the way he did, but we've shared the link um, on our different social media pages. And I'm going to have him on, to, uh, me and Watcher are going to have him on tomorrow. And um, I hate to have him repeat the same thing that he's said. I'm sure he's tired of repeating that, but um, we'll see if he'll uh, explain it to us. I'm just interested to see what he has to say. Um, he, uh, it's interesting to see what he thinks is coming. And a good bit of what he says really lines up with a lot of what we're saying. So it's, uh, again, just additional confluence with the bottom line is making sure you have your heart right with Christ and your family and your preps in order. Yeah. Yes, yeah. indeedy, because you never know what you're, where you're going to find yourself. So here's an update on what's going on over in the Holy Land. Uh, they have not responded yet to the unprecedented Iranian missile and drone attack on Saturday. Uh, mm -hmm. But they did warn that it would respond to the attack at a future time and place of its choosing. Uh, to recap, Iran fired over 100 ballistic missiles, 30 land attack cruise missiles, 150 un or UAVs. Those are what? Um, what are the unmanned aerial vehicles? Yeah, and drones. showed their people and allies that they were not afraid to directly strike the Holy Land. The attack was muted in its scope to avoid provoke to avoid provoked. Wait, I'm reading this article. <laughs> the, attack was, the, the attack was muted in its scope to avoid provoking a massive Israeli response that would lead to a regional war. Had Iran launched thousands of missiles and drones in coordination with Hezbollah, launching thousands of missiles at Israel, then the result would have been undoubted. Then the result would have undoubtedly been different. But they clearly wanted to make their point without triggering a larger response and an all-out war. Yeah. So that's the current update right now for what's going on. You know, um, there's a, a gentleman that I watched just to listen to the enemy's perspective. And some of you may uh, not agree with me on what I'm going to say, um, but I am not a fan of Scott Ritter. I, you know, I, I try to love everybody, but... I do not uh, care for his analysis. He is, uh, in my eyes, on the side of the enemy. And I hope you hear this, Scott Ritter. And um, his, his take and analysis on what happened, you should, you should uh, I'll send you the link. It's, it's a totally different perspective on hmm. um, what happened. He claims that this was a massive victory for Persia and... Uh, catastrophic failure for Israel and this and that and this and that. And um, I hate to say it. I mean, he's um, he is very anti-Israel. And mm. uh, I, I struggle with that. I, again, I try to love everybody, but there's um, that we are coming to a time when the... Unfortunately, there's going to have to be sides picked. And I, yeah. I'm, I, I don't like to say that. You know, I'm but we are approaching that time period where there will be a clear enemy. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, what's your thoughts, man? Yeah. I mean, definitely there's, I, I mean, the time is now to pick your, to pick who, you know, whom you serve. Obviously we serve Yeshua. Uh, we serve the creator and Yeshua is our Lord and our savior. So if you're yeah. and choose life, you know, I mean, when you're choosing Yeshua, you're choosing life. Uh, you know, the creator made the heavens and the earth. Uh, he gave us the rules by which to live and thrive. Uh, Yeshua, Yeshua gave us the example on how to apply those. And we're going to cover a lot of those tonight. You know, when we're going through these through the parables um, that he taught on this day, your a parable is just uh, a story that conveys a deeper truth. And the deeper truth is usually how to apply the law. Uh, so, you know, and, and, and it all falls under the love God and love your neighbor. So, yeah, I'm excited and, to get into that, but we have too much news to cover before we get into that. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, Doug, I saw your comment on Scott Ritter. It, it's fine that he is a established Intel guy. That it, and that's all fine and well, but it doesn't matter to me um, someone's profession or origin. If you know, if if someone's heart's in the wrong place, you know, uh, translating things. Uh, can come out the wrong way. And this is not just from one experience with him. Go back and watch his last 30 videos. He, he has a track record. And I'll leave it at that because I don't like to uh, badmouth folks. But it's... I feel, like I feel like I'm not aware of what you're referring to. Like, yeah. I don't really listen to Scott Ritter. Who is this guy? Um, he's a Intel ex-military guy that... He has uh, some per persuasive influence in the community. He's always doing analysis of military actions and whatnot. And uh, he was very vocal during the, uh, the conflict, um, you know, uh, that was before this conflict with the, the bear country and whatnot. But anyways, he, um, it's worth, if you just want to, in my eyes, if you want to see through the enemy's eyes, there you have it. So... <laughs> But anyways, well, tell, tell us about uh, Australia. I know that um, you were on the up and up with uh, that. Switch to my screen because you got to see the picture of this guy because um, okay. once people see this, most people who will recognize him if they've ever seen anything he's taught from. You guys know this guy? So yeah. he, was, he was stabbed. He's fine. Um, I'm going to read this article. A conservative priest was among several people injured after a church stabbing near Sydney, Australia. The ensuing outrage prompted an estimated 2,000 people to gather outside the church. Hundreds of people were subsequently involved in a clash with law enforcement. I've been to Australia. My One of my first startups was founded in Australia. This is a good example of it doesn't matter if you take guns away from people. People will still find ways to hurt each other. Uh, because Australia is probably one of the biggest nanny states I've ever been to. Nanny countries to where there's cameras everywhere and they have a massive police force. And yet this kind of stuff still happens. Anyway, a video of the attack shows Bishop Mar Mari Emanuel speaking from a podium on April 15th, when a male in a dark hooded sweatshirt approached him and begins attacking him with a knife. Several people attending the service can be seen rushing to the Bishop and attempting to restrain the attacker. Mari Saren, Mari's Saren, uh, sermon was being live streamed at the time of the stabbing Christian leader stat. Uh, so these are some of the article, the headlines, a Syrian Christian Bishop uh, known for his fiery servant sermons as an outspoken cleric of Islam government overreach was stabbed yesterday uh, during liturgy. So Mari leads Christ, the good shepherd in Wakeley and a Syrian Christian Orthodox church, man, that's a mouthful, in the suburbs of Sydney. He gained online prominence during the COVID-19 global pandemic when he expressed public concern about vaccination requirements and lockdown mandates, which he compared, we're going to have to, <laughs> I can already tell you now, we're going to have to request manual review of this video, uh, oh, which he man. compared to a form of mass slavery per the telegraph. New South Wales police confirmed the attacker was known to the law enforcement and did not attend Mari's church. The suspect, who is reportedly 15 years old, I mean, man, 15 years old, has been taken into custody and sustained a injury to the hand. The church confirmed in a statement that in addition to Mari, Father Isaac Royal and two other men were injured in the attack. We ask for your prayers at this time, said the church in a message on Instagram, it is the bishops and the fathers wishes that you also pray for the perpetrator, which I think is good. You know, um, we should pray for those who intend us harm. Um, it keeps us humble. It keeps us meek, uh, you know, because these people can't could be could potentially be saved. Um, you never you, you, you never know what's going on. Um, we also kindly ask anyone at the church premises to leave in peace as our uh, let's see. So here's what I wanted to get to. The four men, the four injured men sustained non-life-threatening injuries and were transported to a local hospital by paramedics. So, yeah, if you've ever watched his stuff, I've seen his stuff. I don't agree with a good majority of some of the things that he says, but, you know, he's a, he's a character. And uh, he does speak some truth, you know, which is a good point. Not everybody is 100% right. We can learn from, we can learn from anyone, you know. No, you're right. 
Remaining uh, humble you know. is is key. As Watchful and I constantly learn. Um, you know, we don't have it right all the time either. I mean, sometimes we're really wrong, but we will we will gladly come forth and say, "Hey, look, we got this wrong." We won't stand on our pride and defend it. It's um, we're we're here to love and learn together, and. Yeah. Not everybody has all the pieces to the puzzle, which is why we network so hard, because we really enjoy communicating and networking with the body of Christ, because that's really, that is the key to figuring out this giant puzzle and seeing what's coming is uh, just openly communicating, staying humble and, and working together with everybody else in the body. And you made an interesting point about, um, you know, uh, bang bang safety there's it doesn't matter if you try to control those or not it's it's an irrelevant factor i mean you can simply look at the statistics where uh, chicago new york and la have the highest uh, bang bang homicide rate in the country with the most strict restrictions yeah um you know criminals are not going to follow the law so it doesn't matter how many laws or restrictions you pass all you're doing is taking the protection pieces out of the folks that will follow the law that can help protect the people in the town. And a good example is, you know, when the Twin Towers happened, they simply used box cutters to take over these planes. They used a yep. straight edge. It wasn't anything fancy. And what you're getting into right now was in a country that is highly uh, aggressive in you know, taking those type of arms off the street, but yet you still have incidents just like this. Anything can be a weapon. You can drive a, a truck through a crowd or you can get a box cutter and go ham. Um, the whole, in my mind, the, the whole narrative of that in trying to confiscate that is a control method. It's definitely a control method because our founding fathers were very clear that we the people are the ones that control our country and we are to protect our country from foreign and domestic terror so speaking yeah. of domestic aggressors did you hear um that the so trump's criminal trial uh is beginning and the judge has required that he attend every single day of the trial and if he doesn't he'll be arrested do you hear about that? Uh, no. Um, why wouldn't if he attend? This is not, if this is not election interference, I don't know what it is. He can't. But campaign. why would he can't even? He can't even go see his son's graduation ceremony. Yeah. Um, well, normally so, something like this. Number one, it's a total sham trial. They don't even have a case. They're trying to. They're trying to take something that would normally even be considered just a misdemeanor. And they're trying to turn it, or, or not even a misdemeanor, uh, less than a misdemeanor, and they're trying to turn it into something criminal. Um, this well, is just a constant, you know, nonstop barrage trying. It's literally election interference. Well, I don't it, understand it, how this can allow can be allowed with somebody who is literally running for president. Let me tell you what it's. And this is the grim reality, and I hope that the, you know, there is folks in powerful. Uh, positions of influence that watch this there is God is going to set things straight in this nation very soon it is clear that the powers that be and the principalities are not backing down from their their devious ways Yeah, they are going to be humbled and let me tell you what it doesn't matter what you know you do to man it's you don't hold that trump card over god and i i really think we're going to see he, some, i almost think god's allowing it to happen just to cause the the, the 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 division because people aren't stupid you know we are not dumb to this to these things and it is it is causing the people who are the last holdouts you know on the other side of the aisle to say i really don't want anything to do with this i want to you know i want a just and fair election this is obviously tampering and and it's not just this it's things like this you know this constant persecution uh you know these 
these crazy laws that are obviously intent for control, intended for control. So I think it seems to be that that is part of the reason this, these things are being allowed to continue. I yeah. think you're right. The I, end result is going to be um, those who are unjust will be dealt with accordingly. Yeah. Um, I think in a way it seemed like the, he was providing an opportunity for repentance, but at the same time, he already knows the outcome. Yeah. So, you know, however you take it. But as we were telling you guys, you know, before the eclipse, we were not expecting anything on the eclipse, but it marked a shift, a turning point, and that we would see stuff that would follow. And we're seeing stuff. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, things are yep. ramping up. Things are ramping up. And I think. Yeah, personally, they're just getting started, and I don't say that to fear monger. I just I say that out of folks need to be uh, prepared. Uh, yes, I, I I don't think we're gonna. This is gonna slow down. I think the birth pains are going to increase. I think the eighth marked a new chapter. Exactly what that new chapter is. Um, it, it's it's like Watchful has said. Sometimes you have to wait until part of the story is complete so you can put the pieces together in hindsight, but yeah. it's clear that there's, you know, you've, everybody can see it and feel it in the air and that you shared a video with me earlier from BP Earthwatch talking mm -hmm. about um, what we had speculated leading um, through the path of the eclipse of things being sprayed and there is a lot of reports now of yeah. folks falling ill. and yeah, a lot of people in the ER. Um, and it's in that time window. Uh, we're within the next probably five to ten days from today. Um, we'll see if this is actually something that's uh, very serious or, you know, it makes you wonder what their actual uh, intention is as I think in the end, it's all part of a bigger devious plan for population reduction. I just haven't put the pieces fully together yet. That is, that is absolutely horrendous. If that is literally what, what is the case? I mean, like you got to think about that. Somebody made the, made the decision to load something up in airplanes and spray them over crowds of people across, you know, across our entire country um what is the intention and purpose of that because so here's the summary of of bp Earthwatch's videos he has dozens and dozens of reports um, that are all similar people with very limited exposure during that time uh, were suffering um scratchy throats swollen throats itchy eyes hard time breathing uh, and many people ended up in the ER and they're, and it's continuing to escalate. He's continuing to get more and more reports um, of this. So it's not a coincidence. This is not just seasonal allergies. This is something that is very serious. Uh, man. That yeah, kind of it's thing uh, is horrendous. It, but if you step back and really look at the bigger picture and really look at uh, a lot of the components and the pieces of the puzzle, it is... And I know some folks don't want to hear this, but it's a massive eugenics program. Everything from certain chemicals that are put in toothpaste to um, ingredients in uh, those jabs to there's even reports now that anybody that takes um, updated insulin, you need to check mm. the uh, active ingredients that they have. There's something I was reading today uh, that really and you want to do this research on your own don't take my word for it just take that as is a a, a a point for caution to look into this yourself but anything that uh, any doctor's office or administration does this it doesn't matter what the medicine is they from what i understand they are including um some new agents that go with everything um, and I shared, uh, there's a video that, uh, Shipley shared on our, on our social platform that goes into detail about this. Um, and it was from a, uh, a very respectable, 
um, doctor that has been looking into this, and I, I shared it with you. I'm not sure if you had time to watch it, um, but it was concerning to say the least. But yeah, really, I the that one today. yeah, but literally the bottom line though is that everything is a massive eugenics process, and well, we know the devil wants to kill people. So he's the one behind this. God of the world is the one behind all of these things. I mean, yeah. that's the whole point of persecuting the saints, right? Yeah. It, you know, well, here's the thing. You know, the the powers that be, the, the, the WEF, who is all those other organizations tied into one, the WHO, the UN, the NATO, all that stuff, they're very open and vocal about their population reduction. So this isn't a, a friend because... Yes, it's not as a secret or conspiracy theory. They, they're very open about reducing um, the carbon footprint and us being the carbon footprint. Um, it's so, it, and, and as they are this open about it, you start to look at all the puzzle pieces that are tied to them. And if you really, really look at it and all the little puzzle pieces from Bill Gates to everything else and what each individual player is doing everything starts to make sense if you will really look at it under you know uh, a little bit of scrutiny and do your own research use discernment yeah along those lines kip sent me another news article today i wasn't even going to read it but since you kind of brought it up uh mexico and genetically modified corn so mexico's effort to keep genetically modified corn out of its country is triggering a trade dispute with the United States and Canada that could affect the future of agriculture. The trade dispute hinges on a key question, whether genetically modified corn poses a threat to human health. So this could be a good thing. Uh, you know, uh, U.S. trade representatives argue that it does not want to force genetically modified corn into Mexico, given that GM seed is used in 90 percent of U.S. crops. This dispute could have far-reaching effects should Mexico win, be, win beyond the U.S. agricultural sector. Uh, it could damage the German and Chinese company that make and sell those seeds. Hmm. Oh. But I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> I, I actually yeah, hit the wrong read button. The article? There it is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, why don't you lead into what um, that, uh, that treaty that you just had up also? The treaty. Oh, the... Uh, the in Japan. Um, yeah, yeah. The uh, So the... Um, what do you call these things? The protests. So we have two protest articles uh, to talk about today. So one of the protests is happening in on the Golden Gate Bridge. Huge, pro yeah. huge protests are shutting down traffic. Uh, and then what is it they're protesting over? Uh, the uh, free, free Pella. Free the uh, people and over there. The siege. Yeah, end the siege now. Stop the world for. So we have people in America that are stopping traffic, causing chaos. Wait, this, and this is this is more than just signs. You were saying, what were you saying that they were doing? You can scroll. You can scroll through it. Scroll through that video. That's this is the video I was watching. If you scroll through it, you'll see there's four or five um, things set up. Um, there is literally four or five different ones that they that they have. Uh, Oh, dang commercials. Um, commercials. But they they had to, they were um, chained up together. And there was four or five different protest spots in there. It, it was, mm -hmm. and it was a really big deal. This gridlocked that entire area. As you go, as you scrub through it, you'll see there's like four or five different areas. There, there's one of them right there. Um, well, those but those the barrels. You were talking about? Yeah, but they have four or five spots. And you'll see, like, in that crowd in the bottom corner, they got, like, a, a curtain up because they're having to saw through them. They're having to saw through them to free them. I mean, and you saw can see all the, you can not, see all not the dust. The, not, not through the people, through the handcuffs. Yeah. <laughs> well, they've, uh, it, they've attached themselves. Well, it, what they're sawing through is the concrete. That's yeah. why there's that dust everywhere. They've concreted <laughs> the handcuffs into these barrels it's nuts that's why they have a curtain up because they're actually using a power equipment to saw through <laughs> i mean it is wow. nuts look at you can just see her sitting there 
And then you see all the dust from the concrete debris. It, look at the other people's arms. Their arms are literally inside of the barrels. You can see them. Look to your right. Those people literally have their arms in those concrete barrels. Yeah, these people are definitely possessed. I mean, because there's a there's a high likelihood they may lose their their hands. Yeah, I mean, I mean, what I don't even thinking? know. But here's the crazy thing: is this this there's four or five of these setups. It's not just there, and it's not just uh, California. This is going on in several places around the country. Wow. Yeah. Yes, very interesting. Um, yep. And at some point, he go. It, enough said on that. It's just holy moly. Uh, go to the Japan thing, and that that is very interesting as well. As we've been talking and warning about this. Yeah, I'm gonna read. It. I'm gonna read this article because it's got some good information in it. Plans for a new pandemic treaty have been in the works works for several years, and Christopher has been talking about this for the last couple of weeks now. Following the COVID-19 outbreak, which resulted in heavy-handed lockdown policies, many argue did more harm than good. In December 2021, WHO member states, WHO member states decided at a special session of the World Health Assembly to establish an intergovernmental negotiating body to draft an agreement on pandemic pre prevention, preparedness, and response. The target date for a legally binding agreement to be adopted by the United Nations Health Agency, 194 member countries, that's a long sentence, is May 2024, according to a report from the Japan Times. So massive protests in Japan. So there's a massive protest against this. This is what we should be protesting. Not, yeah, absolutely. The, not what's going on in the Holy Lands. The stuff that's going on in the Holy Lands was prophesied about and uh, expected. You know, that's God taking care of business. This is, you know, the devil persecuting the planet. This is the beasts um, persecuting. Well, I guess this is also part of God's plans. He's allowing it to happen. Anyway, the 13-day demonstration began on April 13th in Tokyo with thousands of protesters voicing staunch oppositions to revisiting current global health agreements. Under the 2005 International Health Regulations, the WHO, the WHO, already has binding rules for countries, obligations during public health events, including notifying the WHO immediately of health, health emergencies, as well as measures on trade and travel, the Times derailed. Uh, I'm reading this because there's some important information that we want to uh, you know, get to down here. <clears throat> Speakers include Professor Masai, uh, Masayasu uh, Inu and, and modern history re researcher Chikatsu Hay Hayash, sorry if I'm butchering their names, who spoke on the links between pharmaceutical companies and global health authorities, according to Aussie 17. Uh, so that's kind of the main point um, is that they're in, you know, these these guys are investigating the links between pharmaceutical companies and global health authorities. Hayush Haya Hayashi delivered an address urging protesters to resist encroaching shadows of global total, global totalitarianism that would emerge as a result of the new pandemic treaty. The news organization reported upon investigation over 85% of the WHO's budget turns out to be funded by pharmaceutical companies and stakeholders like Bill Gates Foundation. One speaker at a war, rally warned during the demonstrations, and that's what we wanted to get to, is you can see the motivations behind these kind of global policies uh it's motivated by pharmaceutical companies and people we know are up to no good <laughs> so further evidence yeah. of the beast system rising yeah and what's in my eyes what's really the alarming part is that no one is talking about this no one and it yeah, that's is, that's yeah this is not this in is mainstream news this is the most pressing matter I think that we're facing. I, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you right now, this is more important than the, uh, the war that's going on in the Holy Land, the economy. This is the yeah. most, and, and folks don't realize it. it. This is important. This 
if this goes into play and into action, every nation that is tied to essentially the UN and NATO, if there is another sickness, will in that measure, that emergency measure will be invoked and everybody's independent constitutions will be suspended and we will lose our freedom and uh, we will be isolated. And I am starting to suspect that all these bridges that we're seeing could possibly be connected to this. Oh, you know, they're taking uh, them down. Well, yeah, because these are major access points and mm. um, it's, 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 this should be, everybody should be talking about this on mainstream. This is such an important issue. And the harder I try to bring this up, the more I get flagged on regular social media and uh, I got put on put in time out on Facebook for mentioning it and stuff of that nature. Um, I try to talk about it, but I get flagged everywhere I go. So um, it, it is what it is. But this is a very important issue. Folks can, you know, everybody else can pretend like not everybody in this group, but mainstream media is not making a big deal out of this. This should be the center focus. But unfortunately, the ones orchestrating what's going on with the WHO, UN, NATO, they are all the same people that own the media. They are the all owned by BlackRock and the pharmaceutical companies and Vanguard. These are all the well, same main, people. Main, mainstream media. There's well, yeah, a lot not of, in, uh, yeah, there's a not lot of independent media organizations. Media. Yeah, they're raising up. Yeah, the which is an interesting thing that's been happening over the last couple of years is the rise of independent media. Yeah, it's 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 very interesting, and I'm frankly shocked that they haven't dropped the hammer on us yet. Um, <laughs> yeah, seriously, uh, folks like um, the show Redacted or um, what's the one guy uh, Russell Brand? I really like Russell. Um, yeah. They, they've tried. They demonetized him completely. Uh, but yeah. I, the thing is this, there are so many that have sprung up. There is just, there's a ton. I mean, you, it would be difficult to control them all unless they passed like a full blanket bill. But this has been a thorn in their side. This, the independent media uh, sources have been what's proven to wake people up. Because if it was up to just the mainstream narrative, we would all be in the dark. It's yeah. but it's a very pressing issue, and I I can't emphasize enough that that emergency treaty that they are working on with the WHO they this started last May. Um, we're gonna cross a threshold that we will not come back from. I think if this really goes into motion. But uh, I'll leave it. I'll leave it at that. All right. We should move into the segment on what happened on this day 2000 years ago. What do you think? Is that is that all our news? I think we well, probably all we have time. There's for. more. There's more news, yeah. but it's just little piddly stuff um, okay, okay. along the same lines. Yeah, there's sure. a bunch more stuff that happened, but I think we covered the uh, the bulk. Yeah, I, you're right. Let's move on to some scripture. And uh, where are we at in the Bible? Uh, we're going to start in Luke 14. Uh, you want to switch okay. to my screen there? Yep. So I can show where we are in the timeline. So this was the eclipse, and this is where we are now. We're on Nissan 7. So this is the as Jesus has been traveling towards Jerusalem to raise Lazarus from the dead. Um, I wanted to revisit one parable that he um, taught during this journey, during this for the, during these uh, four days before he resur the, before he raised Lazarus from the dead, uh, I mentioned it briefly yesterday, but I think it's um, really important because it's kind of foundational to some of the things that come up um, when we go through the scriptures when he raises Lazarus from the dead. So I'm going to go ahead and read this. So this is about taking the lowly place, and I referred to this uh, when when I was reading about. Um, the servant working either the field or taking care of the sheep and coming in and eating before the master, uh, instead, you know, in law along the lines of increasing our faith. Um, 
So I'm going to read this and hopefully you'll have a better understanding of what I was trying to explain yesterday. So this is uh, take the lowly place. So, and this is a parable that he taught on the way to raising Lazarus. So he told a parable to those who were invited when he noted how they chose the best places, when he noted how they chose the best places saying to them, when you are invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place lest one more honorable than you be invited by him. And he who invited you and him come and say to you, give place to this man. And then you begin with, then you begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down in the lowest place so that when he who invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, go up higher. Then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So this is a really good, this is a really good mentality to have. And this is one of the reasons why I like my name Watchful, is because everybody should be watchful. Uh, I don't want glory. In fact, I eschew glory. I don't want people to admire me. I don't want people to look up to me. I don't want to be seen as any more somebody who's any more important than you are. And that's the attitude that we should have. Uh, you know, you should assume the lowest place so that you can be honored properly. To, because if you take honor that you don't have that somebody else might have, uh, then you're going to be shamed, right? So, you know, if you're if you're the person who wants, who's going to be in first in line because you think you deserve it, and then you know you're told to get in back of the line because you don't deserve it, you're going to be ashamed. Uh, it's better to be the person who's like, no, I'll I'll be in the back. Everybody else go first, and then you know you can be told, no, 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 you come up to the front. You know, you earn this. You're the you're the one who needs to be in this place. That's the mindset we should have as lowly servants. Um, and it helps helps keep your pride and ego at bay because we know the scripture says pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a great fall. Uh, the truth is, is we're all members in particular in the body of Christ. We're all in this together. Um, some of us have have more glory than others, but woe to the person who would take that glory on earth uh, before you know before it, it's time for them to be honored for it. Uh, so uh, it's interesting that he that he told this parable. And this kind of adds a little bit more understanding to the other one that he was saying about the servant in the field eating before uh, the master. It's just like, should you be honored for just doing your job? No, you should just do your job, right? I mean, because we're we're all here. Uh, we have you know jobs to do to you know bring people into a covenant relationship with Yeshua. You know, don't be taking glory uh, presumptuously out of pride. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah, and uh, some folks, there's there is some channels that I will not name that um, I you know I, I will see what they have to say just because they they sometimes have some interesting information, but yeah. the focus will be solely a lot of what they have predicted or or what they have right. prophesied or. It's constantly, I prophesied this last year and this came to this. Or I prophesied this last September in Vegas and, and this came to this. I, I, I get that and that's great. But the glory should be to God. Amen. It, it, he should be the most important element of your message. Christ should be the center point of the conversation. It should not be... It's not a bragging section for, you know, bragging time for, you know, what you thought and said was going to happen. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's sad, it, but I see that a lot. So it's yeah, all I'm, glory I'm especially goes to sensitive, him. I'm especially sensitive to this, having been in uh, many churches before where you have people who really hype up you know, their position, their level, and, you know, the level of respect because they're ordained and they use their position, they use that power to abuse people. Um, so I'm especially sensitive to this because I, I, I want to avoid that at all costs uh, because power can be tempting and people can absolutely use uh, the power of authority of somebody in a position of authority to control people. 
uh, you know, we all stand approved before God. Second Timothy 2.15, you're responsible to stand approved before God. Yet there are people who would have you stand approved before them. Uh, yeah. And we want to avoid that at all costs. If you're if you're with if you're in a church or something with somebody who is forcing you to be approved before them, they need to be humbled. Um, you you know, you you might want to go find a, a Philadelphia church, somebody where you're loved, where you're at, and they're not trying to control you. Uh, you might you might end up with a uh, healthier love for your fellow man. <laughs> Because sometimes they'll steal that love from you for your fellow man just because, honestly, you're being abused. Yeah. We have a comment. Someone, uh, a guest says, by the name of Kelly Leba, people aren't very informed here. I I would disagree, Um, Kelly. We have a pretty uh, loyal group of members that are devout followers of our Lord. And... If you disagree with something that we're saying, I would recommend that you research and pray about it. Seek the truth yourself. Don't take our word for it. But the only thing we're after is the truth. And sometimes people, you know, they struggle with the truth because they don't want to accept the facts. But anyways, go ahead. Uh, I think we're still on where we at now. Uh, Let's move on to... Let's go to let's skip ahead to Luke 17 because there's a ton of parable. Here's all the parables. This is these are all the things that he taught on the road to res- to raising um, Lazarus from the dead. The one we just read was like right in here around 14. Um, so the yesterday we read a bunch of these ones um, down to here. So let's pick it up in how about let's on do the 15? tax one. Oh, okay. No, let's do let's because it's tax day. <laughs> we'll just have some fun. Oh, okay. Read Which one is that? Read uh, let's start in. Um, I think it was Luke seventeen. If I got it right. Oh, okay. Sorry, I was on the parable of the Great Supper in Luke fourteen seventeen. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. Luke. It's like Luke twelve through twenty is just a bunch of parables. It's a, he. Did it's a really awesome. Teaching. It's yeah, really yeah. awesome. I, yeah, re- totally read it. Um, you know, spend some time reading through those parables because they're they're fantastic. A lot of them you've yeah. heard, uh, and it's great to really get them in context. So, yeah. So Jesus, Jesus warned of offenses. Eight. Yeah, so that's kind of picking up where we left off yesterday. Let's start in love eleven, uh, seventeen eleven. Because we oh. yeah we read the we we read up until about verse eleven yesterday. So we'll just pick up where we left off. And uh, get the two parables about tax collectors, just for fun. <laughs> so is that the ten lepers cleansed? Um, yep, let's 17? start there. Okay. Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers, who stood far off. And they were lifted up their voices and said, Jesus... Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And so it was that they went, and they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned with a loud voice and glorified God. It fell down on his feet, uh, fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? Was there not ten cleansed? But where are but where are the other nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory of God except the this foreigner? And he said to him, Arise, go your way, your faith has made you well. So I guess he was did did the other nine not return after being healed or yeah, the other nine didn't return, and the one that did return was a Samaritan. So he he's pointing out that he's a foreigner, and the other the other nine probably weren't foreigners. And what's interesting though is the other nine were only cleansed. The one who returned and gave thanks was made well. 
there's a there's a difference between wow. the, the nine and the and the one who returned and gave gave thanks. You know, the lesson in this here is, you know, give thanks and acknowledge where your healing comes from. Acknowledge where your your relief comes from. If you're suffering tribulation and you pray for relief, acknowledge where that comes from so that you can be made well. Yeah. They, I mean, it, I didn't realize that until you just pointed it out. It's like, where's the other nine? But so the no. other nine, they were they cleansed, but they they were, yeah, really. they were they were they weren't healed. Now, thanks, yeah, they weren't healed nothing. though. Hmm. Well, not as well as uh, not as well as the one who gave thanks because there's a difference. He said, "Your faith has made you well." The others were cleansed because they had leprosy, so they uh, were the others were cleansed, and the one who gave thanks was made well. I think um, Luke eighteen nine is the parable of the Pharisee and tax collector. It is, yeah. Well, we're leading up to it. Okay, okay, all right, no problem. Go ahead. Yeah, we're 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 just picking up where we left off yesterday. No problem. So now we're in the coming kingdom. So this is a fun one. So this is Luke seventeen twenty. Now, when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, "The kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you." Remember, he came to build the temple. Jesus came to build the temple. The kingdom of God is within you. Then he said to the disciples, the days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the son of man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look here or look there. Do not go after them or follow them. For as the lightning that flashes out of one part under heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also the son of man will be in his day. So we're getting into end time references here. This is why I wanted to read this. But first he must suffer many things. So this is Jesus. First he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. You know, what's interesting is there's a lot of future thought in these parables. Um, you know, he's speaking to people in his day and age, but he's also speaking to us who are remotely off. You know, we've we're two thousand years removed from when this was spoken. Yeah. It, but it's, first it's, he must suffer oh go ahead. No, no, it's you're, you're right. It's just, it, it constantly reminds me how incredible the word is, as it is so relevant in today, just as it was then. Well, and you think about it, you know, if the, if the end of the age stopped with him, we would have never been saved. You and me, our listeners, yeah. we would have never been saved if, if, if it was all completed in his day and age. We just wouldn't have been born. That amazes me that he knew we needed to be born before things were finished off. You know, we're written in the book of life. <laughs> we had to actually be born and have life. Anyway, continuing on. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so this will sound familiar, they ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, in that night there will be two men in one bed. The one will be taken, and the other left. Two women will be grinding together. The one will be taken, and the other left. Two men will you know, be in the field. The one will be taken, and the other left. You know what? Um Dalton uh, explained to me a totally different um, take on what you just read. You know, most oh, yeah. people assume that what you just read is a indication of the rapture. That, right. you know, one person is saved and, uh, and one person is left. But if you read the scripture, it says the tares, the wicked are taken first. Mm -hmm. So that is actually referencing the harvest of the wicked and the ones left are 
the righteous. And I well, never thought be. about it. I, I well, never yeah, thought it about it like be. that. Well, well when you look at it in the context, though, you got to remember um, that, you know, prior to this, he said that Noah, that it'll be like the days of Noah, where Noah mm-hmm. was actually taken. Noah was the righteous one. He was he was removed. And then the unrighteous were destroyed. And then same thing with Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot and his family were removed, or some of them were removed, and then those who were evil were destroyed. Um, Hmm. I see what you're saying uh, in regards to the wheat and the tares, because in the wheat and the tares, the uh, tares are gathered up first and burned, and then the wheat is gathered into the barn. So, I mean, you're right. That's why it's so important to read the scripture in context. Um, because a, a lot of people can take that scripture and use it several different ways, but because of the context and it's being related to Noah, uh, you're probably uh, you may you're probably right. But Dalton had brought that to my attention on some of these cases where it mentioned something along the lines of that, and it really had me scratching my head because I had never thought about it before from that position as sure. something that that didn't support the rapture but actually supported uh, the polar opposite as <laughs> well even if it well whether it supports the rapture or not what it's supporting is evil being eradicated um and, and that's actually, the thing that we're looking forward to uh, jeremiah just made a really good point if you think about it the unrighteous were the ones removed and it was noah that was left <laughs> that's a good point yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. Huh. They, were, they were gathered together and burned. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> they were gathered I, together and drowned. <laughs> I, I never thought about it like that until Dalton said that, and now Jeremiah just mentioned that. Um, it's quite fascinating. Yeah. It, only because, you know, you take all the scripture and you put it all together in this giant jigsaw puzzle, it, the key is it never can contradict itself in order for you to put the puzzle together correctly. Though, yeah. what he said about the wheats and the tares and the wicked is taken first, uh, that has sat with me because I've heard that from a few other people as well. That you know you don't want to wish for a rapture because it's supposed to be the wicked that are taken first. And that, that stuck with me since I've started to process it like that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Whether cool. um, it's a correct way or anyways, food for thought. Anyways, continue on. Yep. Yep. Uh, so I'll finish these last couple of lines and then you can pick up an 18 and they answered and said unto him, where Lord? And he said to them, wherever the body is there, the Eagles will be gathered together. All right. And then if you want to pick it up in 18, Uh, This is where we're getting close to the tax collectors. That's fine. And then he spoke to a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart, saying there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in the city, and she came to him saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her. Least by her continual coming, she weary uh, weary me? She's Mm -hmm. coming to... All right. Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him? Though he bears long with them, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, he will really find faith. Well, did I will read that he right? really find faith on? Yeah, will he really find faith on yeah. the earth? Nevertheless, so kind of a comp- yeah. Go, go ahead. ahead. No, you're right. So this is a kind of a complicated parable. Um, I had to read it several times today to get it myself. So basically, you have a judge who doesn't care. Yeah, yeah uh, Yeshua calls him the unjust judge. So if that tells you anything about this man, he basically didn't <laughs> care what God, what the law meant um, from the Torah. He didn't care about the Torah. He didn't care about God. He doesn't have a respect for God. He didn't care what man thought. He just basically did whatever he want. So when Sound familiar. this woman, yeah, right. So to when this woman came to him asking for justice, um, she he denied her. 
But she continued to ask. And finally, because he got tired of her asking, basically because he, uh, the, her continual coming was wearying to him. She, he finally uh, brought her justice. So this is being compared to our father in heaven. You, you know, if, if, if this man who was pestered long enough to to provide justice, how much more were all were our will our Father in heaven, who doesn't need to be pestered? So the point here is pray for the things you need, right? Hear the yeah. unjust judge, and God shall not uh, hear what the unjust judge sh- said, and shall not God avenge His own elect who cry out day and night to Him, though He bears long with them? I tell you that He will avenge them speedily. Right, God will take care of you speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will He really find faith on the earth? Yeah, if. which this that comes up a lot with you know while we're waiting, while we're tarrying for our Lord to return, because He went to go receive you know His kingship. He went He went to go you know do things. We're going to find out all that He did eventually. Uh, but basically, he had to leave for a period of time. When he comes back, is he going to find people who obeyed him and who continued and who believed what he taught? You know, yeah. uh, you know, do we go to God with our needs uh, or do we just give up and give in? Yeah. Right, now we're getting into the parable of the tax collector. All right. Go ahead. Since it's tax day, we got to we got to do the uh, the, the tax collectors. <laughs> All right. Also, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. So this is a callback to that uh, Luke 14 that we read earlier about not presuming (laughs) that you're the honored guest, not presuming your place in line. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. You know, this is this is really good example of how to pray and how to get answers and, 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 you know, how things work. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes and offering tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me. I am a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Right? So you see the difference? You see the tax collector making a big show about how wonderful and great he is. He's exalting himself. He has his reward. Whereas the tax collector just said, forgive me for I am a sinner. And he was the one who was justified. So this is a call back to that 14 about, you know, don't presume your place when you're in, you know, when you're going, don't presume that you're greater than you really are. You're, 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 you're better off being humble and, and meek. He took the words right out of my mouth. It's, it's uh, really, um, if, and I've learned from my own mistakes as the key, really, the really the key to life is love and remaining humble. If, and if tax collectors keep... are sinners. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it really just, it boils down to if you focus on that personal relationship with Christ it, that will all come to fruition. I know I say that every show, and some people are probably tired of me saying that, but there's nah. there's new people on the show, and I, I really have to drive this home because dogmatic religious groups will complicate this matter and really cloud the path for new folks. So I repeat myself often just so that under, everybody understands that, that salvation is a free gift for everybody. He just wants a personal relationship with you. And once you have that personal relationship, all your concerns and, and prideful things that you struggle with will start to dissipate as the Holy Spirit really just comes over you and the humility takes over. So, anyways, Amen. all right. All right, we got a couple more here. Uh, Luke eighteen fifteen. 
This is Jesus blesses the little children. Then they also brought infants to him that he might touch them. But when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him and said, let the little children come to me and, and do not forbid them. For, at, for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. Again, remain humble. Remain remain young and dumb. <laughs> you're better off <laughs> than thinking <laughs> you're... I mean, look at the Pharisees, man. I mean, so many of these parables are lessons for the Pharisees. The Pharisees were supposed to know the law, right? They were supposed to know the Torah. They were supposed to know that all the law and the prophets fell under love God and love your neighbor. They failed miserably. Well, here's they, they, cared the, more, they cared more about mammon. Yeah. It, it, and, and it ties in a, really to exactly what I just said. They were the dogmatic legalistic and yeah. they, they did not put love and humility first. They, um, they were more concerned about, being legalistically correct instead of, you know, loving your neighbor and remaining humble. Um, and it's a perfect example because Jesus really lit them up on a regular basis, which was pretty, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he really, didn't and they what, didn't know what to say. They just stood there with that look on their face. Like, hey. he's not a fan of most Pharisees. There are Nicodemus. He was a fan of Nicodemus was meek and humble and had a proper understanding of things because he recognized uh, the Messiah. Well, uh, it's, by and large, if, if from my understanding, it was the Pharisees who arranged his murder. They they oh, were yeah. the ones that initially plotted and said, oh, "Yeah, we're going to we read have, that. We have, yeah, we have to take him out." Go ahead. Um, there's a couple things in the chat here I wanted to point out. Somebody, I don't, I can't find it now. I read it earlier. They were saying that Bishop Mari. Um, the attacker that attacked him was was supernaturally protected because the knife would not open. What? That's interesting. Yeah. Wow. The guy, the, the guy that attacked him, uh, the, apparently the knife wouldn't open. I don't know if that's true, but that's awesome if it is. Yay, uh, God. Jesus, right? Jesus, too. Thank you for the super chat, brother. Um, yes. Jesus, too. Hebrews 13, two. Be not, be not forgive to entertain strangers. For thereby some have entertained angels unaware. That is so true, man. You nailed it. You never know who you're talking to, guys. That is such a really, really good point. You never know who is approaching you. You know, you never know. Be humble and kind to everybody. It's, it, that is really a good point, bro. It, that was a, a great verse to point out. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. Oh, Kip is reinforcing. She heard that the knife did not open. That is so awesome. <laughs> that reminds me of the two witnesses. You know, anybody who would try to harm them will be harmed in the way that they try to harm them. Man, that seems like supernatural protection. Maybe he's one of the two witnesses. Mm, we're well, getting close it, to that time. Well, here's the thing. It's these supernatural events are going to happen more and more. The, the yeah. veil is thinning and we are shifting in where we stand with just about everything. The it's things are happening now that is going to open up the eyes of some folks that have been lukewarm on the fence. And I think that's kind of part of God's plan as some need to be shaken a little more than others to wake up. Yeah, so. It sounds like there's some back and forth. Some people say they saw a video that it did open. Others are refuting that saying it did not open Re regardless. If it didn't, that's awesome. If it did, he, his life is spared. Um, everybody, from what I understand, there was no life threatening injuries. Uh, there's no reason to, you know, argue. He's still here. We'll eventually, we'll, we will find out in the end eventually. Yeah. Coffee uh, Radio says, I look forward to raising the dead. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I look forward to seeing my grandfather and uh, some other folks that have passed. Um, yeah. I know my mom's sister lost a 16 year old in a car accident many years ago 
Mm. It lost her daughter in a car accident, and she has... I don't think she's ever recovered from it. And this was a long time ago. This was maybe 15, 20 years ago that she lost her baby. Well, wasn't a baby then, but it's always your baby. Um, and she... I, I still think about it almost every day as well. But there's some folks that um, you look forward to seeing. Folks that have passed on that you know went on to the right place. Death is an enemy. I'm looking forward to that death being swallowed up in victory. Conquered. (laughs) Death will be no more. All right. right. You want to read Luke 18, 18? Jesus cancels the rich young ruler. All right. So now a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but the one that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And he said, All these things I have kept from my youth. So when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But when he heard this, he became very sorrowful, for he was very rich. Hmm. Isn't that true? <laughs> People are attached to their things. Uh, you know, we, we acquire things so that we have to give. Uh, you know, we, we know things are coming. We prepare for, for parties. <clears throat> You know, for people to be able to come to us and be taken care of. You got to be willing yeah. to, if you if you desire riches in this world, those are the riches that you will have. Um, if you if you sell all those riches and focus on the things that really matter, you'll have the riches that really matter. Let me, um, can I f- read the following um, verse? Um, sure. Because it's, it's kind of lines up with this. It's. You know, the, the point of the next one is all with God, all things are possible. And then Jesus saw that he became very sorrowful. He said, how hard is it for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard it said, who then can be saved? But he said, The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. And then Peter said, See, we have all left, we have left all and followed you. So he said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or parents or brothers or wife or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who shall not receive many times more in this present time and in the age that come to eternal life. Amen. Do you want to maybe outline um, that uh, section right there so some folks can understand what that meant? Yeah, so one of the things that comes up here often is for it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. There's several interpretations um, of this. The first one we think of is a camel and a, a sewing needle. Um, the, you know, it's, it's much easier for, uh, yeah. Uh, How hard is it for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God for it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Um, it would seem like an impossibility if, if that is what he was referring to. Another interpretation is there were, uh, doorways into the city called, um, the eyes of needles because they were intentionally small. So you couldn't go through them. Uh, you can only go through them one person at a time. You you couldn't send an animal, you know, heavy laden with stuff on it through those doors. Um, and I heard a third interpretation of this from a rabbi who was uh, refuting the eye of the needle. But the point was still the same. So it's like, I don't know what it really means here. What that camel going through the eye of a needle really refers to, because I've heard three different interpretations of it. The point being is that somebody who cares about the riches in this world are going to have a harder time getting into heaven 
entering the, or not getting into heaven, entering the kingdom of God, than you know, something that is seemingly impossible, right? That's the point of that one. Yeah, well, it, his disciples I think, said to that, "Who then can be saved?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, well, the thing is, this is uh, the way materialism works: is you don't own those material items; they That's own right. you. They literally own you. And think about folks and uh, that is listening. Think about all the stuff you have. Think about all this stuff you. Constantly have to tend to it, repair it, fix it, do this, do this, do that. You don't literally own that stuff. That stuff owns you and owns your time and distracts you from your time with God and focus on many other things in life. So yep. yeah, that's my take. Now, are we saying to go sell all your things so that you can work for the key so that yep. you can enter the kingdom of God? No, <laughs> no. Christopher's doing that. He's selling everything he owns. <laughs> No, he's not. Yeah. No, I'm but selling a lot. We, you know, we're where we're at. You know, you know, we, we have excess. You know, I have things that I can get rid of so that I, you know, have more resources to help others. Likewise, Christopher. Um, yeah. You know, what is your mindset for the things that you have? Um, I personally, you know, I lived in my car for a period of time. That was I was so happy from a materialistic perspective living in my car for a lack of having things because I was able to focus a hundred percent of my time and energy on studying the scripture and listening to God. And I think that's really the point is things distract you from doing that. So, you know, get rid of the things that distract you and that will help you enter the kingdom of God. That will, that will, uh, you know, you'll receive far more riches from doing that, uh, than putting your time and energy into things. It, it took me, a long time to really figure this out, you know, for most of my life, I seeked happiness and fulfillment through, you know, earning lots of money and buying lots of stuff. I am very guilty of that. And they, I think I was trying to fill that, that missing puzzle piece in my life and that missing puzzle piece was my relationship with Christ. But at the time, I did not know that. At the time, I was just trying to fill it with all this stuff. And it would temporarily, maybe for 24, 36, three or four days, it would somewhat fill that hole or that void. But it was a charade. But, yeah. and I'm sure other folks can relate to this. So once you really understand what really Im is important in life, you see things from a different perspective. And yeah, I am selling a lot of stuff, but this is stuff that I have excess. I don't need it. For, in my eyes, if it doesn't serve the kingdom or serve protecting the kingdom, I, I really don't need it. And there's a lot of stuff that serves the kingdom here and serves protecting the kingdom. But then there's a lot of stuff that... Um, you know, I could turn that into um, capital to better serve the kingdom and, and what we are trying to do here with our mission. So we're yeah. not saying everybody should sell all this stuff. That was not the point. But it it's it's just a good teaching and understanding of things and your time and how it can affect you, um, all that stuff. But nevertheless. I was, I was recently listening to Warren Buffett talk. Um, and he was saying that, you know, one of the big fallacies in life is that the more you get, the happier you'll be. And <clears throat> he was giving an example, you know, you'll never recreate, you'll never experience that same feeling you got with your first car. You know, that was, it was new, you were afraid, you know, maybe you didn't know how to drive it. You were, un, you know, you weren't sure if you were going to keep it safe. You know, it's a whole experience. Um, and then, you know, then you go get a nicer car. So maybe your first car is a beater and then you go get that nice new car and then it's a whole different feeling. And then, you know, and he, he, he leveled it all the way up to, you know, sports cars, boats, houses, yachts. It's like, you know, when you're constantly chasing that feeling in order to recreate the first experience, you never catch it. And that's one of the tricks of this life. You know, it's just like, if you're always chasing what you think will bring you joy, you're chasing the wrong thing. 
true joy comes from serving bringing people into a covenant relationship with Yeshua, bringing them into an understanding of the creator and what he has given us. <clears throat> when you're helping your fellow man, when you're bringing them into the kingdom of God, that's where you get true riches. Those yeah. you're going to have joy throughout eternity. The, the stuff you chase on, on earth, it, it's, it's fleeting. You're constantly chasing it with no return on your effort. Uh, for because once you get it, there's no real joy in those things. So, anyway, stuff. Yeah. Cool. we can probably move on from this. <laughs> yeah, Paul, you made a good point. It's, it's, again, we're not saying sell all your stuff, but no. your 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 stuff, it serves the kingdom. Like these computers, uh, my radio system, these serve or help protect the kingdom. These will come into um, use. Um, yeah. now the excess computers or, you know, the third and fourth car in the driveway that I don't need that I bought cause I thought it looked good. Those are things that are excess that I can turn into capital to help with our mission. That was kind of really all I was going with it. There's a lot yeah. of excess. Um, and I just, you know, I, I want to trim the fat, including the watch I wear. If anybody is uh, interested in a nice watch, I have this one along with several others for sale. Um, yeah, you can find the details on that online. So some people like nice watches. I was one of those um, one of those guys at a point in my life where it served a purpose. Uh, it was a very vain gesture, and it was also an investment at the time. But it's something that I have very little interest for now. But um, uh, are we still reading scripture? Yeah. So we're going right. to go back a little bit. To because now oh. we're getting to the point where Jesus is, um, we're getting close to where he uh, raised Lazarus from the dead. So I want to go back and kind of do a little reminder. So we're going to go to John 11. Hey, uh, and in um, verse, go ahead. I, I, I'm going to be listening, but I have to get my daughter something. So just when I switch sure. to your screen, know that I, I'm not ignoring you. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. So we're going to go back a little bit. We're going to go to John 11:12. And so this is, he just found out about his friend, Lazarus, who's dead. He's talking to the disciples. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Then Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also let us also go that we may die with him. And a smart ass remark. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb for four days. Okay. So this is a period of time where he traveled. Now I'm going to go back over here because this is the same thing. So this is him talking to his disciples. This is Luke 18, 31. So Jesus a third time predicts his death. Then he took the twelve aside and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man will be accomplished. For he will be delivered to the Gentiles, and will be mocked and insulted and spit upon. They will scourge him and kill him, and the third day he will rise again. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not know the things which were spoken. <clears throat> so now we continue. This is as they continue traveling on the way to go raise uh, Lazarus. So then it happened as he was coming near Jericho. So this is <clears throat> where he traveled. If we go down here. So this is where they started. So this is Jericho. And then they traveled up here up here to Bethany. Uh, this is roughly not exact. And this path may not even be correct. This is literally the modern day path. Um, it could have been any other paths. So this is the, basically the, where he traveled from, where a lot of these things took place that we're reading about. Uh, then it happened as he was coming near Jericho that a certain blind man sat. So this is them starting the journey towards Bethany to raise, like I said, I think we know where we're at. Then it happened as he was coming near Jericho that a certain blind man sat by the road begging and hearing a multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. So they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by and he cried out saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then those who went before him 
before warned him that he should be quiet, but he cried, but he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he had come near him, he asked him, saying, What do you want me to do for you? So this is funny. I mean, this is hilarious. So basically, somebody hears that Jesus, and he must know that he can heal people because he's saying, Son of David, have mercy on me. And people are telling him, Quiet, quiet, quiet. You know, keep your mouth shut. He's, you know, busy. He's on his way doing something or whatever. And he just <laughs> cries out all the more. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Uh, so Jesus stood still and commanded him to be brought. And when he had come near him, he asked him, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. This is a good lesson. When people tell you to shut up and sit down, sometimes you need to be more vocal. Um, you know, your your faith can make you whole. Uh, it's not saying to be unruly and rude. Uh, but in cases of need, you know, this is believing. This man heard that this that he could be healed. And when the guy who does the healing comes by, he did whatever it took to be healed. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. All right, now we're going to pick it up. In eleven, I think there's some more. So the rest of this, uh, the rest of this is parables uh, in eighteen. So in um, <clears throat> you have Jesus blesses the children, the rich young man, the love of riches, leaving the things of the world behind, and the parable of the workers in the vineyard. Um, so then, so we're just going to pick it up and finish uh, uh, here when Jesus goes and raises Lazarus. Lazarus. Um, Christopher, are you back yet or should I keep reading? Uh, I'm assuming you're not back. Okay. So we are back in John eleven seventeen. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. This is Lazarus. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. So this is Jerusalem and this is Bethany up here. The best I can tell. I don't know if that's really two miles, and this may not be exactly correct, but when you go look up on the map, this is what is listed for Bethany. So, I mean, it could the two miles could be here to here. This distance here is like, I think, it's like 18 to 20 some odd miles that they came from uh, Jericho to Bethany, and then from Bethany to Jerusalem, just to give you an idea. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Now, Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Hey, that pertains to our day and age, right? We're within days of this happening. <laughs> so what she said is true. <laughs> so Lazarus, Lazarus will again rise at the in the resurrection at the last day. <clears throat> However, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. And when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary her sister, saying, The teacher... Are you, oh, you're back. <clears throat> you want to read this part? So we're in... Uh, you want to read John eleven twenty eight? 28? I'll let you keep reading because I'm... I'm in Luke okay. in my Bible. Um, I'm sorry. I'm fixing <laughs> fixing dinner yeah. for my babies at the same time. Gotcha. Okay. So John eleven twenty eight. 28. And when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, the teacher has come, is calling and is calling for you. As soon as she heard that, she rose, she arose quickly and came to him. Now, Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, She is going to the tomb to weep there. 
Then when Mary came there, came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? Then said to him, Lord, come and see. This is, I think this is the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. Even Jesus cried. Then the Jews said, you know, it's interesting that he cried, even though he knew Lazarus was going to be, was going to come, you know, raise up, rise up. Kind of makes you wonder. Um, well, he, I don't think like, he truly this, knew because he had to ask his father. Exactly. Uh, yeah, that's exactly uh, my point. It's like, you can believe and it's, it's available if God makes, if God does it. But there's that chance that now's not the right time. This thing may not happen. So yeah. uh, it's not like it's a lack of belief. Uh, you know, yeah. it's okay to cry. Because <clears throat> he was stings. He, he was he in the flesh. Lazarus. Yeah. He was in the flesh yeah. and he had to ask his father for um, that. That's right. Then the oh, Jews said, it. see how he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? <clears throat> then Jesus rose, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead for four days. So there's a couple things about this. <clears throat> So I believe the Hebrews, uh, so there's a, they, they would put, I, I, I saw a documentary on this really recently um, where a couple of guys were touring the city of Jerusalem um, and they talked about how uh, uh, Gehenna got its name uh, because that's where they would throw the garbage. So the the and i think it's still called gehenna to this day like the the place of burning they would throw their garbage there and they would burn it so they would often use that as an example of the place of burning um, or of torments uh, and one thing that they had pointed out is that in the tombs they would put people in these stone tombs and lay them on a rock and cover them with cloth uh, so that they would decay so that all the insects and stuff would come and eat the flesh and that the bones would be left so that's what she's referring to here is he's he's been in here for four days he's already starting to decay and it's gonna stink uh, and they did this because then they would take the bones and go bury them somewhere because it was a lot cheaper to bury bones than it is to bury an entire body so these tombs that they would put people in were literally a place for them to decay for a period of time yeah uh so did you have something you want to say Oh right, no! But it, I can't. The that that movie that we talked about maybe a week or two ago, the the Gospel of John. You can find it on YouTube. It's the story of Jesus Christ. It 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 it, it essentially uh, told the the Gospel of John in chronological order and used the scripture throughout the movie. It was a really awesome movie and it really portrayed what you're talking about right here as they went to the tomb and he literally jesus got on his hands and knees and prayed to god to um you know for lazarus to you know come back yeah okay so picking it up in verse 40 jesus said to her did i not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, this is a good way to pray. This is an example of how to pray. This is how Jesus prayed. If you want to know how to raise somebody from the dead, this is how he did it. <clears throat> Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this that they may believe that you sent me. Now, when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And when he had, and, and he whom had died came out bound hand and foot with grave cloths and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. 
All right, so now we're actually going to get into the plot to kill Jesus. I'm, I'm coming. Uh, I'm going to let you keep reading. i got to grab something for her. I'm sorry, guys. Hey, let you keep yep. reading. Yeah, so this, so this raising Lazarus from the dead was a key event that led to the plot to kill Jesus. Because the, the devil can't have people believing these things that he was doing. He can't have them believing in the Messiah. So now he's marshalling those who <laughs> worship him, the devil, uh, to kill the son of the son of God, <clears throat> the plot to kill Jesus. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things that Jesus did, did believed in him. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things that Jesus did. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, what shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone's going to believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. And one of them, Caiaphas, being a high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. Okay, so you can see their motivations. Um, they're they're afraid of what the Romans will do as as a result of this. Now this he did not say, now this he did not say on his own authority. You know it's interesting because later on in the record when um, he's before I don't is it Herod? I don't think it's Herod. Um, the the man who finds no fault in Jesus and offers uh, Barnabas uh, in and offer offers them a choice to choose between uh, Barnabas is it Barnabas or yeah, between Barnabas and Jesus to be crucified, and the people choose Barnabas instead. So it's interesting the dialogue that's going here to where they, you know, nor do you consider that expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not the whole nation should perish. Now this he did not say on his own authority, but being high priests that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. Oh, that's interesting. But being a high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus, does that mean that he had previously prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation? Hmm. Man, that's interesting. I'm going to have to look at that in further detail. And not for the nation only, but also that he would gather together in one of, in one, the children of God who were scattered abroad. Then from that day on, they plotted to put him to death. Therefore, Jesus no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there into the country near the wilderness to a city called Ephraim. And there remained with his disciples. I tried to find this Ephraim. I'm sure it's available. Um, the name, from what I understand, has changed to Tabath, um, but I couldn't actually nail down where it was. Um, I think I tried to put it <coughs> Taibi. I don't think that's it. So this is Jerusalem, and this is what comes up as one of the potential names for Ephraim. I would assume that it's probably closer to this. So the city of Ephraim, somewhere around here. Um, because he's in this area, he's in like this area and this area, this is where they want to kill him. So I imagine he's just out of their reach for now. And there remained with his disciples and the Passover of the Jews was near and many went from the country. Get rid of this. And the Passover of the Jews was near and many went from the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then they sought Jesus and smoke, spoke among themselves as they stood in the temple. What do you think? That he will not come to the feasts? Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a command that if anyone knew where he was, he would report it, that they might seize him. Hmm. Yep. And then now we are on to the next day. So in verse John 12, it's, it's the next day, which will be tomorrow. Yeah. Six days before Passover. So that concludes basically what we, what I wanted to cover for Nissan 7, the uh, parables and raising Lazarus from the dead. Yeah, and um, if Mark is able to join us, that will actually be perfect because his this is something he's very uh, versed in. He's He might be teaching us. Yeah, he might be teaching something similar. Yeah, he's flying in from D.C. tomorrow. Um, he said he's 
pretty sure he can join us. He's going to confirm with me in the morning. So, um, okay. but guys, thank you everybody for joining us this evening. We always enjoy the fellowship. It's, it's something Amen. that it's, it's very special to both watchful and myself. Um, we love seeing the, the same faces and the same names every night. And if you guys have not linked up and set up your profile on our social media site, it has uh, really grown fast. Um, it's, it's, it's really neat to see our entire community gathered there. And we have other communities that are merging there with us now. So it's it's really uh, it's really just fantastic, and we're able to share things there that we can't share other places because of censorship and and stuff of that nature. And I don't feel as I guess the best word would be paranoid about being tracked and monitored and flagged and censored as you know I commonly commonly get on other platforms. It's a definitely a lot more laid back setting. Does uh, anybody so have any? Corrected. Go ahead. Kip corrected my uh, the name. So I said Herod. I meant Pilot, uh, and ah. I said Barnabas. I meant Barabbas. So thank you, Kip. I saw a couple of other people brought that up too. So those were the names I was getting wrong. And Kip asked a good question. Also, could it be that um, Cyphus was? How do you pronounce his name? See if Cyphus. Cyphus was Caiaphas. not the. True... He doesn't have it spelled. It. It's not spelled right in her comment, okay. but it's Caiaphas. He was not the true high priest, but John the Baptist as the son of Zechariah would have been the high priest. Hmm. That's, yeah, um, probably. That's interesting. Very. Yep. Uh, anybody have any questions before we wrap it up? We, we enjoy everybody joining us always. I know I've said that already, but remember, and I know that I'm a broken record with this, but salvation is a free gift. For folks that are new and watching us, remember, Christ died on the cross for everybody, not just some of us. He doesn't want anybody to go to the hot place. He died for everybody. And all he wants is that personal relationship. That's what he's after. He just wants a personal relationship with you. So if, if at all possible, try to... Think about how simple it is. I know that a lot of organizations and some of these large churches have their very complicated processes of being saved. You know, keep it simple. He just wants a personal relationship with you. And if you focus on that personal relationship, everything else will happen naturally. I'm telling you, it is that simple. Everything else will happen naturally if you just focus on that personal relationship with them. All right. You got anything else, Watchful? Uh, Jeremiah had an interesting question. Has anyone else been struggling with being easily provoked since the eclipse? It's been a challenge for me. It's interesting that you bring that up because a couple, I don't think it was from the eclipse, but it's been recently. Uh, yeah, a lot more. Uh, a lot more of that being easily provoked. It's been a challenge. Uh, I was uh, thinking it was interesting because Ben had made a comment that as the magnetic shields are weakening, one of the effects of that um, is it has an effect on our bodies. And one of them is strife and struggle and offenses. Uh, so keep that in mind um, that, you know, you may be easily provoked Um it's a good opportunity to practice not being angry. Uh, you know, if, if you feel like you're going to say or do something that you may regret, maybe maybe take a break, <laughs> go for a walk, uh, or just wait it out. I know I've had to do that myself several times in the, in the past weeks to where it's like I wanted to say something, I wanted to start a fight, I wanted to, you know, tell somebody they were wrong or get after them or, you know, whatever, whatever the scenario was, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, it seems like it's a thing. to. I've been noticing it. In fact, there was, you know, we've even noticed it in our chat, you know, um, where, yeah. where people are just getting after each other. <laughs> I tell you what, the, the weekend leading into that eclipse and Kip will attest to this, everybody was at each other. Um, yeah. Even and even in our small groups where we have uh, a lot of the admin folks in the show that interact Man, it was uh, it, that was a very interesting weekend, Kip. It just about everybody 
had attitude with each other. And, <laughs> and, and yeah. it, Kip was calling everybody going, I don't know what's going on, but everybody needs to chill out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it, these trying times will continue and it's just, it's important to remember, um, your roots and just keeping it simple. You know, that personal relationship with Christ, that is the key. If I'm ever at a crossroad where I'm not sure what the best path is, I try to keep it simple. And I know this sounds cheesy, but I just, what would Jesus do? I ask myself that frequently. If I'm ever at an impasse where I'm unsure, um, I ask myself that simple question. But guys, yeah. we'll see you tomorrow night. Uh, same time, same channel, same holy place, or whatever I said last time. <laughs> but uh, Shabbat Shalom, Shalom. Yep, and hopefully we have uh, Mark with us at, on the show. But if not, uh, we'll see you guys tomorrow. And thank you so much. We love you all, and we'll see you tomorrow. Goodbye.